Hello, welcome to Bobington Tank Museum in England. We're here today to have a look at this beauty, the Centurion, how it came about and how it became one of the most successful tanks following the last World War. By early 1943, about halfway through the war, British tanks were in a bad way. Chronically unreliable, undergunned and mostly weakly armoured, with the notable exception of the Churchill. But by this time, the British did at least have the right ingredients. They just weren't all on the same tank. There was a really exceptional gun, the 17-pounder, originally a towed artillery gun and a match for the German 88. There was also a powerful and reliable engine in the Rolls-Royce Meteor, fitted to the Comet, and previously the Cromwell. And most important, there was now the combat experience to help design a really viable tank. Attempts have been made to squeeze the 17-pounder gun into existing tanks, like the Sherman Firefly. Cromwell and Comet went a step further with the Meteor engine, and the Comet had a good gun with a version of the 17-pounder. But both had thin, unsloped armor, which made them vulnerable. So in October 1943, the specification was issued for a totally new tank. To combine the 17-pounder gun with the Rolls-Royce Meteor engine and around 80 millimeters of sloped frontal armor. It carried the snappy title of A41 cruiser tank. But there was a problem. British industry then focused in building existing tanks to replace the ones lost in Normandy. So prototype manufacture did not actually start until January 1945. And the first prototype, now called Centurion, was delivered in April. But early trials went so well that mass production was ordered straight away, and six prototypes were shipped out to Germany for tests under active service conditions. Although they never saw combat action in World War II. This is the Centurion Mark I, weighing in at 45 tonnes. Now you can immediately see that the whole shape was unlike all the earlier British designs, with, at last, sloped frontal armour. Up top it's got the 17-pounder, and at the back it's got a Rolls-Royce Meteor engine. What's not to like? In the armour department, this new tank was so much better protected than its predecessors. There's over 150 millimetres on the turret, and over 76 millimetres here on the front. Now, this doesn't seem very much, and it was, in fact, no more than the Comet, which you can see just over here. Remember that it's now quite steeply sloped, effectively making it 94 millimetres. Our very British way of describing guns at the time needs a bit of translation. This 17-pounder translates into 76.2 millimetres. Now, this may not sound that big, but it was as good as the German 75 millimetre of the Panther, and at a higher muzzle velocity than the German 88mm with a similarly flat trajectory. With a standard armoured piercing round, it could penetrate 150mm of armour at 1,000 metres. With a newly arriving discarding Sabo, the APDS round, this went up to a whopping 233mm at the same range, more than enough to see off any likely opposition at the time. It was a visibly big improvement over the 75 that the British tankers had been using. Secondary armament was unusual. Instead of a coaxial machine gun, the Mark I Centurion actually had a 20mm Polston cannon, a simplified version of the Ehrlichum. This was for use on targets that didn't call for the big gun, like trucks, armoured cars and infantry. There was no whole machine gun, soon to be the case on all modern tanks. Under here is the famous Rolls-Royce Meteor engine. Now, we can't see this one, but we can do better. This cutaway gives us a great view of the engine. A V12 pushing out around 650 brake horsepower. It was a derated variant of the legendary Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which had famously powered planes like the Spitfire Hurricane and Lancaster Bomber, and many more. The new Centurion did not use the same Christie suspension that had worked for the Cromwell and Comet. 
because the projected 45-ton weight of the new tank would have been too heavy. Instead, it used something called the Horseman system, which actually dated back to 1922. But this development of the principle was so good, it would even go on to feature in later British tanks like the Chieftain. It basically consisted of three bogies, each carrying two wheels which were sprung. This allowed greater wheel travel than earlier bogie systems, which greatly improved cross-country performance. In common with earlier British cruiser tanks, the dry sprocket is at the rear. This is a Mark III. There were a number of improvements, but mostly to the firepower. It now had a totally new cast turret with a 20-pounder or 83.5mm gun which had a fully stabilised gun control system for accurate firing on the move. The British Centurion tank, acknowledged to be one of the finest in the world, is seen demonstrating something which other tanks haven't got, automatic gun stabilisation. This means that the gunner can maintain his sights on a pre-selected target no matter how the vehicle moves and turns or bumps over rough ground. It would be impossible for the gunner to fire with accuracy in such conditions without the stabiliser, but with it, well, the picture gives the answer to that one. The Centurion story started well, but there was no indication then just how successful it would turn out to be. In all, there were 13 marks of Centurion, and this is the Mark 10, pretty much its ultimate form. And while it still looks like its predecessors, there is a lot of changes, some visible and some under the skin. The big difference is this, the 105mm L7 gun, one of the best tank guns of the Cold War era. Also fitted to many other tanks, like Germany's Leopard 1, and even the early Abrams. Notice the fume extractor halfway along the barrel. And here's the round it fired. Big enough? Now this gun could ultimately penetrate up to 400 millimeters of armor out to ranges of 3,000 meters. Enough to take out the new generation of Soviet tanks like the IS series and even the T-55 and later arrivals. Some countries that adopted the Centurion also adapted it like the Swedish variant of the Mark 10, called the Stridsvagen 105C, distinguished by the additional armour that had been added to the front glacius and the turret. Here on the right of the turret is the commander's position, and you can see all the way around him he's got episcopes giving him very good 360 degree view. When he's inside the turret, he's also got a number of controls. He's got turret traverse, and also the radio controls, which are just to my right at the moment. Now in front of the commander sits the gunner, who has the usual traverse and elevation controls, and also a gun sight directly in front of him. Over to the left in the turret, we find the loader's position. The back of the turret was used for storage, mainly the 30 caliber ammunition and also the smoke grenades. Up front, on his own, is the driver, and he has all the usual controls. Down there, there's a clutch, the brake, and also the accelerator pedals, and the gear levers in the center. The steering levers are further forward on each side, and that lever on the right is the handbrake. The museum have got this fantastic cutaway of the Centurion. It's actually been sliced in half. And what it does is give us a really good representation. You can see the close confinement the crew worked under. Across on the right-hand side of the tank there, we can see in the uppermost position, we've got the commander. Now, the commander's fully closed down, i.e. his hatch is closed at the moment. Directly in front of him, and you can see how close they're sitting, we've got the gunner's position and all the optical equipment in front of there. And the gunner's position, to be perfectly frank, exactly the same as nowadays on vehicles, worst position of the tank, no room whatsoever and quite uncomfy. In front of those two, we've also got the driver, which you can't actually see at the moment. Now, if we move across to the left-hand side here, we've got the loader's position. 
Now, straight away, you can see that the loader's got the most room in the turret, and he's actually got the ability to stand up and stretch his legs a little bit. It's a great cutaway here, and it clearly shows that the radio installation he's got behind him, and also at the moment, you can see that the loader's in the process of loading around into the breach. The Centurion arrived just too late to see action in World War II, but it made up for this afterwards. First in Korea, then Vietnam, India, the Middle East and Africa. Now, given that this tank was conceived in 1943, its operational life was incredible, and there are still updated Centurions in service throughout the world today. But there was only so far that this, essentially World War II design, could go. Change was needed to match the Soviet trend towards the bigger guns and heavier tanks and particularly the IS heavy tank series. The 105mm L7 met the need for a long time, but even that was not going to last forever. In its current form, the Centurion's turret could not mount ever bigger guns. So as part of the development work to find a successor to the Centurion, new turret designs were trialled. Come with me. This is the Vehicle Conservation Centre, and it's absolutely cram-packed with interesting vehicles. This is the FV4202 prototype. Now the chassis is standard Centurion, but the turret is new. As you can see, it's wider with a more pronounced slope on the front and the sides, and there is no mantlet, in the style that's become typical of the modern main battle tank. Now the prototype had a 120mm gun. However, this, fitted at the moment, is a 105, just for display purposes. This is essentially the turret that would have been mounted on Britain's new chieftain considered in its time to be the best main battle tank in the world. Chieftain would also carry over many elements of the Centurion's tried and tested chassis and suspension, but finally with a diesel or multi-fuel engine. But that's another story. <laughs> 